Hello, church family. Thank you for joining us online. We are so grateful to have you. And listen, if this is your first time joining, we are so honored that you decided to join us. Whether you're watching this in your home or maybe listening to it in your car, or maybe today you find yourself lonely, angry, frustrated, depressed, overwhelmed by life, we believe that God, He wants to speak to you today. And maybe you're full of joy. Maybe you've got so much hope. I want to encourage you that God wants to continue to be a light to your path. And we believe the Word of God, it's powerful. So lean into this message, check it out. I'll be with you right after this. Katie and I had a really good time away with the kids and um, just a family vacation and it was great. We call it a family vacation, um, family trip, I should say. It's not a vacation because the kids were there. <laughs> no, it was a trip. It was a trip, but it was a really good one. And um, we feel really blessed and I feel honored to, I just feel honored to build this house with you. And I am, I tell you what, I went away and I got to pray. I, I read a book called, um, uh, praying like monks, living like fools. Has anyone read it? One person? Oh, yeah, you and I talked about it a while ago. I read it again. By the way, I'll be honest, I don't think I read it the first time the way I should have. It, it shook me. And it's a powerful book. If, you, if you're like middle of summer, you're kind of trying to figure out what to do, uh, praying like, you know, no one's writing right now, so I'm like, no one's interested. I can just tell. You guys are very still and serious. Did I do something wrong while I was away? <laughs> But I'll tell you, I read that book, and it, it's just, it really calmed my soul. And there's this beautiful line in it. It says, you know, history belongs to the intercessors. You know what an intercessor is? Somebody who prays, who stands between, who's in the middle, who goes before and prays and stands in the gap for others. And I just believe that even in this season, as we pray together, as we develop our spiritual side, I just want you to know, when I was away, God was speaking to me like crazy about our church. It was so cool. I told our team, I don't want to, I want to make sure that we're, we're, I got a lot to share today, so I'm just going to start talking if that's okay. Um, but you know, when I, I went away, I told our team, I said, don't just like um, rest and relax. Like relaxing isn't scrolling through in Instagram. I want you to replenish because if you're a leader or God's called you to do something, you can't just be relaxing, like just like sitting back and watching Netflix. That's not good for your soul. You, you know that, right? Like I'm, we're not like being there's something called bed rot have you heard about this it's an article a study just came out about bed rot people say they're taking mental health vacations by staying home and being in their bed that's not healthy folks please hear me that is not how we replenish you, you understand the word rest and replenish relax replenish is a different thing replenishing is a filling of your soul it's that you have a spiritual tank and you must refill it. By the way, this has nothing to do with my message. And I'm not sure how in the next 30 minutes I'm going to go about this. But just hear me out. Some of you need to hear this. It's time for you to replenish your soul. Do you feel drained? Do you feel tired? you got to find something that's going to replenish your soul. It's going to fill you up again so you can be healthy and you can give everything that God has for you to others. And not just for yourself, but for others. You with me? Okay, cool. I am going to start a new series today, and we're going to um, open up our Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And there are so many things that I want to do between now and the end of the year. Um, formation that I want our church to, to take place, John chapter 8. Um, there's so many things that I want to see happen here. Um, and we're about to read a story that is not in Matthew, it's not in Mark, it's not in Luke, and some early manuscripts actually do not even have this story in it. But it's, it's, chap, it's, it's John 8, and it's verses 1 to 11. And it, it's a very powerful story, and I, I, I wonder why um, the other Gospels do not record this story. And I, I think I have so many thoughts about it, and I've been reading and studying so much. And, um, but today, what I want you to know is that when you see something in the Word of God that you do not see somewhere else, I, I would tell you to make sure that you take 
special care and attention to it so that you can understand it within the context of scripture as a whole and so that you can digest it and you can understand it in a healthy way and you can allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I just want to be very clear that the Word of God is not just what is powerful here, but it's the Spirit of God on the Word of God that makes it God-breathed and what changes our lives. It's not just words in a book. It's that the Holy Spirit, when we read Scripture, it actually speaks to our lives. And this Scripture is very unique. This context, this story is very unique because in order to really grasp the story, you'd have to really put yourself into the character's position. You have to understand what's going on. And this is about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. She was caught in the act of adultery. And we're going to read John 8. But before we do that, I want to set up this, this series, if that's okay, this, this new series that we're going to be going into. And it's, it's called Search and Rescue. Is that okay? This series is going to be called Search and Rescue. And I, and I want to talk to you about this because as we head back into the fall and we go back to school and as we kind of kick back into gear, I think it's very important for all of us to refocus the point of why we are here. Why does T-H-E exist? Why does this church exist? Why? What is the point of church? Why do we have church? I, um, I was with a... Uh, a pastor, you know, in New York, and I was sitting with him, and a young guy, amazing guy, and we were talking about preaching and, and studying and, and preparation, and, and I was telling him about some things that I do and I've learned, and he was sharing some stuff that he's learned, and I asked him, I said, hey, last weekend, how did your altar call go? How did your invitation to receive Jesus go? And a very kind young man, he just said to me, he goes, I didn't have one because there was nobody in the room that needed Jesus. There was nobody who, there was no new person there. There was no one that I didn't know. The people that were there had been coming to church for the last 15, 20, 30 years, and there was no one new, so I didn't do an altar call. And it, it, it hit me. I'll be honest, I was sitting there, and, I, and, I, and I, it begs the question. It begs the question, and, and, and again, we're going to talk about stones in a moment. We're not throwing stones. It does beg the question, though, is what kind of church are we going to be? What is the point of our church? Why are we here? Why did Jesus come to earth? What was the point of this whole thing? Why do we exist? So we can get a prophetic word? So we can feel super spiritual? So that we can feel more holy than other people? Why do we exist? What is the point of the church? What did God empower us to do? What is the goal here? What should be a priority and what should be a major and what should be a minor? What should take precedent over everything else? What should be the values of the house? What should matter to us more than anything else in the world? These are really important questions as you decide where you're going to first attend church, but also what kind of life you're going to build for yourself. And what actually matters to you? Because we started this service by saying we are not natural beings. We are supernatural ones. That means that God has a call on your life. That means God has a plan for your life. That means God created you with intention, designed you for a purpose, and has a plan for where you're headed. And I want to encourage you today that our mission is very clear. Unfortunately, mankind and humankind and religion, it complicates this message greatly. So what we're going to do today is we're going to refocus. Why does this church exist? Why are we here? What is the point of this whole thing? And I have a question. I have two questions for you. We're tying the series called Search and Rescue. And I think sometimes when it's topical, man, um, people who read the Bible chronologically or go through the Bible in order, and I love that, those denominations. And some of those people, actually, I study a lot of those guys. I love them a lot. But sometimes they knock those that do not go through Scripture that way because we do what's called topical preaching which, and sometimes exegetical preaching, which is a different type of preaching. And I'm saying all this to say to you, not to confuse you with weird or strange language, but just to say to you that every time we come together, we have to look at Scripture. We have to make sure sure that we're looking at it not through the lens of what we think about it but what did Jesus say about it and what did Jesus do because we are not supposed to imitate ourselves we are supposed to imitate Christ are you with me so the question is as we talk about search and rescue is the first question I have for you is did Jesus search does Jesus search did Jesus seek did he look for people did God does God go after people Ooh, great, we're here. We did it, we did it. First, Does he rescue? 
Does Jesus save? Does Jesus rescue? Did Jesus ever say that? I'm so glad you asked. Luke 19. Don't turn there. Let's go up on the screens. Luke 19. For the Son of Man came to... For the, read it with me. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save. Jesus says this. Jesus says, the Son of Man, speaking about himself in the third person, which is rad. <laughs> the Son of Man came to seek and to save. He came to search and to rescue. That is why Jesus came. What are we doing? Our job is to what? Is to seek for those who are and to help them find and by doing that, our whole lives will be incredible. We'll be blessed. We'll be overflowing. They'll be full of trouble. Sorry, I know it's not an American gospel. It's just the gospel. It'll be full of challenges. It will be full of hardships. It will not be easy. You will feel like your back is against the wall a lot. You will feel counted out, but God will count you in. You will feel like you got nothing, but God has given you everything. You will feel at times like you are marginalized, like you are belittled, like you're an outcast. You will feel like you are inferior. You will feel small. You will feel like you are serving when others are leading. And God has called you to that exact thing. And God will bless you as you seek the way that God seeks. As you love the way that God loves, as you serve the way that God has called you to serve. And our job is to seek and to rescue and help those that are lost. But I've got some news for you. We do not do the saving. Very, very important. This is a critical moment for us as we decipher here, as we unpack scripture here, as we talk about this together. We do not do the saving. Jesus does the saving. And I'm sorry to be so practical this morning, but it's very important as you build your life that you realize the reasons why we exist. We are not natural. We are supernatural beings. Are you with me? Jesus does the saving. We do the telling. Okay? Jesus does the saving. We do the telling. In 1 Corinthians, 1, 1 Corinthians 1 13, it says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through the, its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what we preached to save those who believe. A couple months ago, I went through the Great Commission with you in Matthew 28. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want you to know a couple things, right? There's the Great Commission, which I like to break it up into Sunday and Monday. Do you know what I mean by that? The Great Commission, Jesus gives us a Great Commission, and he talks about what we should do on Sunday, and he talks about what we should do on Monday. I'm putting that in cultural context. So Sunday is what? The first thing, if you read Matthew 28, I can't do this with you right now, but we went through it a couple months ago. I'm going to share it to you and just recap what happens. He says this, the first thing that he does is he tells them to come to me. Come to me, all those that are thirsty. Come to me, all those that are hurting. Come to me. So the first thing that we do in the church is we come to him. What you did today is you came to God. You came to the house of God. You said, I'm not, I don't need the world. I need God. I need to get his spirit inside of me. I didn't come because I just want community. I didn't just come to hang out. I came to meet with God. Come to me. That is why we come. And once we come to him, the Bible says that in, in Matthew 28 that they saw him and they did what? They worshiped him. You see, what happens is when you come to God, when you see, coming to God causes you to see him. And when you see him, you worship him. That's what we were doing earlier in the service. Does that make sense? But then he says this. What does he tell them then? This is about Sunday. Now we're going to Monday. Are you with me? And I'm, I'm breaking down the Great Commission quickly here for you. It's come first. The words there is come to me. The next one is what? Worship me, which is to see me. Come to me, see me. The next one he says, go. That's Monday. So we're supposed to come here on Sunday. We're supposed to see him. And then we're supposed to go and what's the last part? Tell. Go and tell them what I have done for you. Go and tell them your story. Tell them how you were a mess from the ground up and God set you free. Tell them how you didn't have it all together, but God saved you anyway. Tell them how you came into church a mess six months ago, a year ago, 16 years ago, 60 years ago. I don't know how old some of the people are in this room. However old you are, you came to God. God changed your life from the inside. And I got to let you know about the story of the grace of Jesus. If you want to know what we're about, Jesus is our message. There's no plan B for humanity. God is going to 
going to use his church. He is going to use the kingdom of God. He is going to use his plan, which is his son, to bring redemption to all of our lives, to set us free for all of eternity. Are you with me? We're about to read John 8. That was it. I set it up, okay? We're going to read John 8. And John 8 is a moment we have to, as I said earlier, need to get into the character because understand that this woman was caught in the act of adultery, which means this. Um, she was in that moment having an, an affair. We don't know if it was the man or the woman. It just accuses the woman, which is interesting. But this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And so she was caught in the act, and that means that she probably would have been unclothed. It means that she would have been humiliated. In that moment, she was having a private moment. Have you ever done anything in private and it felt good? But then if it got revealed, it wouldn't feel so good? That's what was going on right now. So her sin was private, but religion was attempting to shame her publicly. And what happened was she was dragged. And I don't know if you could imagine this moment, but, you know, in Hawaii, in many places, and in, in Oahu even, like, I'm learning it's a small town. Anybody know what I mean? You know when you know somebody or know something about somebody? This is what this was. This was a small town. So this woman is dragged out. She's probably not very clothed if they allowed her to get garments or whatever, because in that day she would have been stoned for what she did. And we're going to read about it in a moment. She would have been stoned because according to the law, the law of Moses, this was a sin. This was a sin for her that she would be brought to death for. And she's brought before all these men and the people in the community. And I wonder how she would have felt in that moment. We have to take this moment and, and understand that the character, the woman here, she's a person, and she's got a life, and she's, she's doing something in private that she should not be doing. And by the way, it takes two to tango. There's a man involved. And that man probably has a family. Or maybe she was the adult. Who knows? We don't know. But we know this, and it's only one record of it. We know this from the context that clearly there was something going on in this story that was not okay. And, and in this moment, Jesus is being uh, put on the spot to, to identify what he should do about this woman according to the law. And what they are attempting to do, the religious, as we read it, and I want to give you this context right before we read it, what the law, what the religious are attempting to do is put the law between God and the people. This has always been the plan of the enemy, to separate us, not to get us to sin. I keep saying that to you. It's not about sin. It's about separation. What was the garden about? Sin? No, it was about separation. If, God can, if the enemy can separate us from God, then he can isolate us and kill us. And so the goal here was not about, it was not about sin, Christian. It was about separation. It was to get Jesus between the law and the people. And if he could cause the law to be between him and the people, he would be just like them and not like a savior. Okay, you with me? Is this okay? Do we want to change subjects? I got another message. I wrote so many while I was away. Can we clap for a second? Can we just thank God? I, I just need to hear some sound or something. Come on. This is good, right? I'm excited. I got 15 minutes left to preach this entire message. You ready? John 8. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and sat down and taught. As he was speaking, the teacher of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. I got to imagine they threw her down. I got to imagine that she's thinking, man, how did they know? I got to imagine she's thinking, I wonder if my family knows. You gotta imagine she's probably like, what does it feel like? Like when the rocks hit you. She knows what's happening. She knows the law. She lives in a small town. Everyone goes to temple. Teachers, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down, stooped down, and wrote in the dust with his finger. Many theologians and scholars have tried to figure out what this was for centuries. We can talk about it in a moment. It's a lot of fun to talk about. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, 
Meaning, go ahead. Do it. But then he says this. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again. And he wrote in the dust. I wonder what that was like. I wonder if he was close to her when he did this. Because they threw her before him in the crowd. So I wonder when he got low if he was where she was. That's what I kept thinking about. I was writing this message. I was like, man. Because there's so many moments where it talks about with Jesus' body language more than just his words. It talks about his actual figure, fig, figure, his movements, his movements, his writing of the hand. You know, it's interesting because they're talking about the law and, and who wrote the law? Who wrote the law? Who gave them the law? And it was written, right? So Jesus writes. So interesting. He writes in the dirt. Where did they come from? Where did humanity come from? The dust. Just there's so much happening. I need you to get in the story with me. There's so much happening here. Jesus is writing in the dust. He's writing in the dirt. He keeps stooping down. Why? To be with them. I think he's trying to be with her. I think he's going to where she is. And I think he's explaining something to all of us in this moment. When the accusers heard this, notice they're not called religious, they're called accusers. Notice they're not called Christians, they're just called accusers. They're not called Jews, they're called accusers. They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, which is funny. The older you get, the more you're like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm 40 and I'm like, I've done a few things. <laughs> Some of my guys in here know what I'm talking about. I'm like, Ugh. it's funny how you can get religious, huh? Is it funny? Oh, I'm right. Are you? <laughs> I'm not. I'm out. <laughs> it's just interesting. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with this woman. There's no way I'm going to get to preach this whole thing. I'll just start doing it next week. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did one of them condemn you? I love the simple words, no, Lord. No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. Many, many, many people would love me to stop and talk about how she said go and sin no more. And I think it's so important and I think it's very relevant and how Jesus clearly, clearly here, he is not excusing her sin. He is not giving her a hall pass here. Man, she now has to carry not only the weight of her sin, but now the weight of the public shame that's in her community. This woman is paying for this. She is paying for it. She already has paid for it. And Jesus is simply warning her, warning her, do not go back to this. This is terrible. You don't want to be here anymore. This is not good. This is a horrible situation to be in. Don't ever find yourself separated from the heart of God again. Don't find yourself so far away in your quiet sin that you can't find hope again. Do not do this. Thank God I'm here right now. Don't go back to that life. That's where most preachers, I would say, in some settings would love to spend my time. I'm not going to do that today. I want to talk about what Jesus did for her. I want to talk about how he rescued her. Do you know, um, so I, I went running. Don't laugh, okay? I ate a lot of pasta while I was away. <laughs> I'm looking at my wife. She thinks I'm cute still. <laughs> but I, but I, I went running while I was away. Don't laugh. I ran three miles. It was shocking. <laughs> I actually didn't make it. I didn't make it. If I'm being honest, I did not make it. I went, yep, you know where the story's going. I went with Katie to drop the kids off. They were going to this little camp in New York. It was cool. Like, cousins all went there. So she went to this little camp, the kids. And I'm like, Katie, I'm going to run home. (laughs) 
She's like, what? I'm, I'm going to run home. She's like, you back to the house? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, Phew. She's like, wow. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I start running. You know, I'm running, I'm running. So I'm running. I get three miles in, a uh, quarter of a mile in. Um, I start running. It's hot. I'm sweating. I got my Apple Watch. Thank God. Hey, Siri, call Katie. Oh, gosh. 15 matches for Katie. Uh-oh. Pray for me. Woo! Where's your accusers, Lord? So, hey, don't laugh in church. Do, do, no, you cannot have fun here. That's one thing you cannot do is have fun here. So, so we got eight minutes left. This is, I, I haven't even started. So I'm running, and I call Katie. It was crazy. What, the moment I started running, I got tired. I got worn out. And then I called Katie, and I said, Katie, I'll be home soon. No. I said, come and get me. She, she says, all right, where are you? I'm like, a block from the... No. <laughs> I said, come and give it. Sorry, this kid's so bad. Come, stop laughing because you're going to make me keep. So she's like, <laughs> laughter is like medicine for the soul. John, don't try to bring Proverbs into this, okay? Um, so I'm running, and, 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 the, <laughs> and, and I, she goes, but the moment I called her and I said, Katie, come and get me. And she said, I'm on my way. No shame, thank God. Felt it a little later, but that's fine. It's another conversation. And as she's coming, and I'm thinking, do you know what happened to me the moment I knew she was coming? What happened? I got, I got some energy. I started putting a pep in my step. I started being like, man, I'm feeling good. I'm like, I was almost going to call her back and say, don't come and get me. I got this. But it was crazy how I, when I knew that there was a rescuer, when I knew that there was somebody who was coming for me. <sighs> I know I'm talking about how much pasta I ate, but bear with me. This is spiritual. I'm talking about God 2,000 years ago. He sent a rescuer for you. He sent somebody to save you, to rescue you from your sin. You're all sinners, saved by grace. Romans 3.23, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve death, but because of Jesus, he has given us life. This is an insane message that is not just for the saint, it's for the sinner. It's for the downtrodden, it's for the guy who can't run anymore, it's for the person who can't overcome that sexual temptation and has a low-grade sexual fever that is running through our culture constantly. It is for everyone that has got their back up against a wall and doesn't know where to turn. It is a good news for the saint that Jesus sent himself 2,000 years ago to rescue us from our death, from our sin, from our shame. And he paid a price on a cross that we could not pay. He wrote a check for a dinner we could not afford. And he gave us freedom through his son. God gave us freedom through his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could have eternal life for all all of eternity. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Now, 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 this woman is rescued. She's free. Jesus sent his son. God sent his son to rescue this woman. In John 8, 3, I want to read this one more time. As he was speaking, the teacher of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery and put her in front of the crowd. Religion attempts to reveal secret sin, to double the weight with public shame. You see, it's not just sin that hurts us. It's the shame we feel from that sin. And I am for a moment, I'm talking to the church for a second, because we in this circumstance, we are the religious, meaning we are the church, we are the, the synagogue, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Those are negative words today in context, but they actually were not negative words then. They were just simply religious people. But over time, because of how they treated everyone, they became not, not known for what they are for. They became known for what they are against. Man, who sounds like that? And it wasn't what they were for anymore, it was what they were against. And I wonder today how many of us, what we are known for. 
how are we known? And, I, and as I'm thinking about our church, as I'm thinking about where we're headed, as I'm thinking about how we're growing, I'm just going to ask you to do me a favor. And I'm going to ask you to look around your own life and look around your own soul and look around your own heart. And I'm wondering where there are things that have been thrown in front of you, things that other people have done, mistakes they have been made on this island, people you have known for years in a small town and you have seemed to write off. I was telling our team this morning. I think I want to be the kind of church that brings people in from all over the place. I want to be the kind of church that invites people that other people write off. I want to be the kind of church that welcomes Republicans. I want to be the kind of church that welcomes Democrats. I want to be the kind of church that welcomes the liberals. And I want to be the kind of church that welcomes those that are struggling with their sexual identity. I want to be those who are struggling with their future. I want to be, I want to be with those who are kind of religious bigots sometimes. I don't like them, but I'll be around them because I won't be kind enough and gracious enough, even though they're not kind and gracious to me, to love them anyway. I want to be that kind of church. I want to be the kind of church that doesn't throw people out because of what they did two years ago or three years ago or hold them to the past or what they did wrong. I don't want to be that kind of church. And some of you are like, we don't stone people anymore. We've gotten better. That's not true. The comment section is stones, folks. Your article reading is stone throwing, folks. It just is. That's where we're at today. If we find out something good about you, good about you, great. But the moment we find out something bad about you, man, we're throwing stones. And we never forget those stones. And I think it's time we drop them. I felt like God said, I want a big church. That's not something I've been saying, have I? No. I said, God, what are you talking about? A big church. No, not a big church in numbers, in people. I want a big church in spirit. I got convicted. I was driving through Wyman Hollow this morning. I was on my way here at 5.30 a.m. because I couldn't sleep, jet lagged. 5.30 a.m., driving through Wyman Hollow. And I drove past Obama's house. And I felt God say something to me. Just, I'm telling you, this is just family talk. I felt God say to me, do you have a church big enough that if Obama walked in, it would be okay? And I felt God say, not in size, in spirit. Do you think that that guy in Waimanalo who told you about three, two years ago, he can't come there because people would see him. Do you think your church is big enough now that they'd be big enough in spirit to receive him? Do you think that that musician that called you a year ago and, and told you he can't come to church because when he goes to church, everyone judges him because sometimes he comes strung out on drugs. Do you think he'd be able to come to your church today? I started getting convicted this morning, church. The tears were running down my eyes. I was talking to my mom and dad. I said, I want a church that's big. I want a church that's got a big spirit. I want a church that receives people that other people have written off. That's the kind of church I want to have. What about you? I don't want to be small. I want to be big. It doesn't mean that we put up with sin. It doesn't mean we tolerate sin. If you know me or you've been on my leadership team at all, you know that I don't tolerate things. But I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to love everybody and we're going to start dropping stones. Dropping stones dropping stones it was so interesting but they tried to trap jesus and i'm done i can't i can't i got no more time they tried to trap jesus who were they trying to catch who were they trying to catch who got caught let's ask that question they did Je jesus didn't get caught The sinner didn't get caught. They did. I don't want to be caught with stones. Can you imagine what it must have felt like when she heard those stones hitting the ground? Even if you got your head down, you can tell when people are looking at you, right? Imagine she started feeling like, man, Getting kind of quiet. Where is everybody? And I love this moment because then it just ends with her and Jesus. You know, last night Noah's never done this before, Auntie Tutti. She woke up in the like 3 45, 4 o'clock, and she was screaming. She had a nightmare. You ever have a nightmare? Like a nightmare. She had a nightmare. She, she, she was screaming, and I, I didn't hear it at first. Katie ran inside, and she, she went up to her, and she comforted her and loved her. And I just, I think about that moment, but my daughter last night, she had a nightmare. 
And my wife got up out of bed and she ran to my daughter. Do you know when you have a nightmare, you know what God does for you? He runs to you. Do you know when you have sinned and you've done something privately? You've been living away privately. You've been living away that now has been exposed publicly. You know what he does? He runs to you. You know, sometimes the, the question gets asked, like, do you think she was upset that she got caught? Or do you think she was upset because she, but Jesus didn't care about any of that. You know, my brother's a firefighter in New York in a small town in Long Island. And, you know, I, I was with him a few times and the radio went off and my brother's like, I got to go. And he bounces and go run to the fire. I started thinking about it. I'm like, I bet he doesn't ask when he gets there, like, did you start the fire? Was it you? Who did this? You know, I bet you didn't get seen the accident where the driver, the driver was driving drunk and, and he's, he's clearly intoxicated and there's bodies laying on the ground. I know he's not doing it in that moment. You're drinking, you idiot. I don't think that's what he's doing. No, I know what he's doing. He's getting them to help. He's getting them service. He's getting them, he's serving them. He's loving them. He's getting them free from whatever situation they find themselves in. And when I think about Jesus, I think about that's who he is. And that's the kind of church I want to have. Are you with me? Jesus is our message. People are our passion. God is our focus. We are not going to be a church that rebukes. We're not going to be a church that hurts and harms everyone. We're going to be a church that protects and then rebukes and then corrects and then loves because Jesus does that for her he first what he protects her then he corrects her he doesn't correct her and then protect her no it's very important that we see what Jesus did here he protected her he brought her in and I want to know if we're going to have a church big enough that Donald Trump could walk through our doors I want to know if we got a church oh, people like here. it's ridiculous well, we have a church big enough that, you know, Biden can walk through our doors. Do you know that when Biden lost his son, do you think God was there if he called on him? Do you think that God was there for Donald Trump when he was feeling the pressure of the moment? I'm talking about politics in church. Oh, my God. This is what we've been waiting for. Stop it. What are we talking about? We're talking about are we big enough? Do you remember when Chris Rock and Will Smith had that moment? Do you remember it? What happened? Oh, yeah, we could get into it. Chris Smith. Chris, Chris Smith, that's very funny. Dyslexia. Chris Rock, Will Smith. Why was that such a big deal? Because it was public. We are so good at bashing people publicly. I'm telling you right now, this is going to be a big church. Oh, here we go, talking about numbers again. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about big in spirit. We're going to be a big church. There are going to be people that are going to walk in here. It's not going to make sense to you. You know what's so funny when people are accusing other pastors? You know, because we live in Hawaii. Sometimes I hear things about pa other pastors. I'm like, man, I know them. They just live far from them. So they can... Give me something to throw. Just, I just, I have to, it's just very important. Like, it's funny. Like, I think we think, so, Joe, I'm sorry. Don't hit, don't hurt me, okay? Like, I can hit Joe, so I throw it at him. But Coach K, I can't hit Coach K. Oh, so sorry. So I'll, I feel like I can throw him. I, th I feel like that's sometimes how we feel. Because we're far. Because distance creates distortion. We can throw things at people I tell you what it's evil no matter how close or far you are hear me do you want to be a big spirited person a big hearted person I pray we do I want to be a church that includes that loves that is gracious and is kind by the way it does not mean we are going to excuse it means that we are going to love and we are going to embrace and as we do that we believe like I did when I was running I think a rescue is coming to get me and when you know you got a rescuer on the way your whole life begins to change when you know that God loves you so much that he will come to where you are and he loves you too much to leave you the way you are when you realize that everything begins to change in your life so stop worrying 
talking about what's happening in our country and get back to loving your neighbor, taking care of your community, loving your family, doing the right thing. And as you do that, I promise you the grace of Jesus Christ is more than enough. We do not need you to do more. We need you actually to do less and surrender to God and say, if it was not for the grace of God, I don't know where I would be. And I need you to start praying. I need you to start loving. I need you to start giving. I need you to be gracious. I need you to be big hearted. And as we do that, I believe people are going to look around T.H.E. and they're going to go, how is that kid from North Carolina with that local guy from Waimanalo? And how is this auntie with this young community preaching to her on Sunday morning? Why would she even be doing that with these people? Why is she? All of a sudden, before we know, people are going to look around and go, I don't get why they hang out with each other. Why the heck? How the, what the, the guy from New York? Why Manalo? What the, the heck? I, that's what the religious is scratching their head. Like, I don't, I love that. Because then we get to go, we got to tell you. Got to tell you a story. We got to tell you what God did. God brought us all together. Yeah, not because of our gender. Not because of our religious backgrounds. Not because we're Jew or Gentile. Not because we're Hawaiian or Haole. No, he brought us together because of his grace. We love one another. And you're not going to believe what God's about to do next. Are you with me? Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. Jesus. Jesus, I want to talk. I want to pray for two people. First, to those who are holding some rocks. God, forgive. God, forgive John Termini. God, I ask you to forgive me. God, I ask you to forgive me where I've held rocks. God, in August, I'll be here two years, God. There's some people I met when I first got here, God. I, I felt you even bring them to memory, God. I, I let them go. I release them, God. I, here, in front of our church, God, I, I confess, God, that I need to let people go. And God, I thank you that you, God, you are faithful, God, to save. God, I pray for those who have thrown rocks at us. I pray for those who have been harmed us and been enemies of us. God, I, I pray, God, I pray for them today, God. God, I ask you to forgive me, God. God, I ask you to forgive me. And Jesus, I, I thank you for those, God, who feel the weight of shame today. God, who feel the weight of sin today. Who feel like they can't come back to church. Who feel like if they walked in here, God, they wouldn't be accepted. God, I pray that you can help us change that, God, by telling people about how you seek us and how you save us. I thank you that when religion tries to suffocate us and when the culture tries to steal us, Jesus, you save us. God, I thank you when the religion tries to suffocate us and the culture tries to steal us, God, you save us. Jesus, we thank you that you're a savior. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you are in this room and you are in need of a Savior, His name is Jesus. If you need God to save you both from your religion and from your sin, if you need God to save you from just your sin, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand and say, I need help today. I need a Savior. I see your hand. 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 Thank you, Jesus. If you need forgiveness today, I want you to raise your hand and say, I need Jesus in my heart. He's going to save you today. I'm going to ask you to say this with me as a church family. Say, Jesus, everyone says to me, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, give me a fresh start, a new beginning. Jesus, I make you Lord. Amen want us all to say this. Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of the rock. If you're in here and you're thinking, I don't hold rocks, I, 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 you're the very person that needs to pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive me of the rocks I hold. My rocks can be thoughts. It can be private. You don't have to say it out loud. My rocks can be things I say. My rocks can be comments I write. My rocks could be things that I say to my spouse. I say in private. I drop all my rocks. Jesus, help me be big spirited. Help me be a part of something bigger than me. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your saving, for your forgiveness. In your name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, can we thank God? Can you stand to your feet? Hey, so many people made a decision to follow Jesus. Thank you today for making that decision. It's the greatest decision you can make. And we as a church, we're going to get better on how to help you. But we got a Bible in the back. Just let somebody know about that decision. Be a part of the community of faith. And church, we love you so much. Thank you for, uh, for just being here. Thank you for being a part of our community. I, I just think it's just the beginning. I'm so proud of us. I'm so grateful for us. I'm so excited for us. I'm, um, I know it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And I believe that as we continue to build God's house and we continue to serve him and serve each other, God's going to do great things. Amen? Amen. I love you. Let's sing the doxology together and uh, we'll get out of here. Thank you, church family, for joining us online today. If you just made a decision to follow Jesus, we want to encourage you. That is the greatest decision you can possibly make. We would love to help you along on the journey. A simple way to do that is just to click the link below and there's a button that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. We would love to give you some practical next steps. The other thing we want to tell you about is how you make the house a home is you join community. We believe you grow within community and we do that through rooms. We've got rooms that meet all over the island and also all over the islands and even on the mainland. We're starting live rooms that are going to be happening on Sunday mornings and we are so excited to bring the message of the gospel everywhere and into your living room. We also want to thank our giving community, those who give week in and week out. There's a link below that you can click on, but we are so thankful for your generosity. We believe the life of the generous, it gets larger and larger. Thank you for sowing into this soil. Thank you for being committed to this journey with us, and we'll see you back here next time.